I will try to give a brief development on an overview of developments in oral history. What will I be talking about? Basically, uh, two main things. First, very shortly, what is oral history? And then secondly, uh, what are the developments in oral history from about the 1920s until now? So to start with the first question, what is oral history? Um, how would you define oral history? Um, recording and analyzing the memories of past. Like it's very brief, but <laughs> it's very brief. It's very broad. It's it's about the kind of the common uh, uh, way that oral history is being actually defined, which also yeah. So uh, no, I will just add a few words about oral history after you. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so it also shows you that uh, oral history actually is a rather broad discipline. There's very um, a kind of well-defined standards within history, uh, but there are also a lot of other disciplines that use oral history um, uh, in a certain sense and usually have slightly different kind of methods and standards attached to that. And we will talk a bit about that later. Um. Uh, I, for me, it's like um, constructing the reality uh, in a moment or in the period of time when you are communicating with another person. It happens now. So this is why it's... Now I mean when I'm communica communicating with Tanto or Rafa. So it's like... Um, this is why the oral history as a method is really interesting for me. Because it's really... Um, Authentic and uh, real. Right, it's very good. Yeah. So it's authentic and it's real, and at the same time, as you said, it's very much bound to the specific time and locality and kind of a background and the development of your conversation that you're talking about at a certain moment, right? And so we will come to that as well. So um, uh, about this constructing, as you say, of narrative and reality. So, so these are two common uh, ways that that uh, oral history has been defined, so the interviewing of eyewitness participants in the event of the past for the purposes of historical reconstruction, or even more kind of broad, uh, the recording of personal testimony delivered in oral form. And as you can see, this still can go in, in very many uh, directions and be worked out in many ways from there. In, uh, in the discipline of history, you see that Oral history is uh, very often used complementary to other sources, so often people use both interviews as well as uh, archival material or, uh, or any other kind of material, newspaper materials from a certain time. It can be anything really. Um, and uh, as said, it is used uh, mainly to, uh, to understand the experience or interpretation of events of specific people or groups of people. Um, so that's that. I'm uh, going to move through the history quite quickly, inevitably. However, if you have any questions or you would like to raise any point of discussion, feel free to kind of stop me at any time and do so. Ah, just have to press harder. So, who makes oral histories? Narrators and the researchers as well. Yeah, yeah, yes. sure. So you have uh, professional historians, you have narrators. Uh, who else? Sociologists. Sociologists. Psychologists. Those who interpret. Psychologists. Yes, uh, uh, basically a, a whole range of people, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very popular discipline mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, so you have also sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, museum curators, uh, etc. And, and as said, not all of them make oral histories in the same way. So there are some differences. Um, and uh, there are also some who say, no, oral history is only what historians do. Uh, I tend to favor a more broad definition, but this is um, something that you have to decide personally, I guess. As well as amateurs, oral history is a very popular uh, kind of thing to do also by people who just want to explore their own family history or the history of their own village or 
um, uh, or anything like that, right? So it's, it's very broad uh, in that sense. Um, this also is one of the reasons why um, uh, oral history, uh, oral historians and people who conduct oral history projects have uh, different goals in doing so. So um, oral historians coming from history often tend to emphasize basically uh, the product. They're recording histories, they're uh, making a database that they can use as well as others to then interpret, right? Whereas um, um, another branch of uh, historians, especially social historians, and we will come to talk about it later, but also anthropologists, social scientists, and people uh, who do amateur oral history, let's put it that way, often uh, have different roles. For instance, the empowerment of individuals or social groups. So uh, they emphasize the process much more than the product. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, giving a voice to certain people, having them speak. Uh, sometimes it's about healing communities in the case of truth commissions, for instance, so we will talk about that as well a bit later. Um, however, there are also some common points to most oral history projects. The first thing is it's about understanding narratives of memory. Um, uh, and we will come to this when we talk about the developments. But you see this shift really from recording history in order to record factual history to the understanding that oral history is really about recording how people have experienced history on a personal basis. Um, and it's the interactive nature of history which you were referring to, right? So you're in this process together, the interviewer and the narrator are in this process of shaping this narrative uh, together and the results of the project develop in this process of interacting interpreting. Okay. So then we move to uh, oral history's development over time. Oral history as such is not a very new method. I mean, people have been using, of course, oral accounts of what happened for for ages in the West, for instance, the ancient Greeks used oral accounts uh, uh, to record on history. And you have other examples from other parts of the world, just the same, basically. Um, but what you see happening in the 19th century is basically that oral history gets devalued as a way of doing history because it is uh, being viewed as not objective. So uh, in that time, uh, and I think most of you who come from a historical background that I've heard of uh, von Ranke, uh, you see that there's the, the attempt to develop history in a discipline that functions according to the same logic as uh, science uh, subjects, um, and to come to history as it really were, or be as I think it is, uh, by uh, focusing on mainly on written sources and, um, and uh, uh, oral sources are not seen as objective, and this results in a period in which oral history is hardly used by professional historians. Um, until then, you see in the 20th century a recovery of oral history, which uh, starts with a couple of important interview projects in the interwar period. Um, and uh, then basically takes a flight after the Second World War, and especially from the 1960s when uh, uh, recording devices become much easier uh, to get and to take with you for larger groups of people. In the 1920s uh, and 30s, as well as in the 1950s, so the direct uh, period directly after the war, uh, you see that there are two basically focus points in oral history. The one is a uh, focus on elite experiences, which is quite close to the genre of uh, biography or autobiography. Basically with the idea that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, politicians or other elite groups uh, have information about specific events that others don't have and you want to ask them about that. So that's a very uh, uh, important strength in oral history at the time, and at the same time you see at that time already a kind of a focus on recording folklore and ordinary life. Um, 
to uh, develop archival collections very often because there was at that time this sense that the world was changing very uh, soon. There was a lot of progress to kind of record these, uh, these, uh, uh, these folklore, these habits, these uh, uh, things that were happening uh, that uh, people felt were getting lost very quickly. Uh, one very important uh, project in that time was the U.S. Federal Writers Project, which was actually a New Deal project. It was started um, in order to, um, to. It was started basically at the time when there was massive unemployment, and uh, the government employed a lot of writers to collect these histories in the U.S., both the countryside, but also, for instance, um, they developed a slave narrative collection of. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, people who had been slaves up until recently in my district, which is still a very important collection. And the project received funding from 35 to 39, but it ran until uh, 43, effectively. So what you see here already is basically the two main trends in oral history that you still see today. So on the one hand, you have these, uh, this oral history as um, as complementary to the use of documentary sources in elite studies, where you think you can get these extra behind the scenes uh, looks. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, this oral history is kind of a way to diversify history, especially away from the elite. So you also have uh, people speak that would otherwise not be heard in so correct. So basically, uh, yeah. It would seem that when people go into the job of the people who get kind of famous. Mm -hmm. sure, elites can be in, in many different yeah. groups. They, they can be uh, elites of yes, political, yeah. they can be scientists, they yeah. can be bankers, they can be uh, yeah, people whatever. who are famous. And, and, and. They would be people that you ask because they have a specific knowledge about something yeah. that otherwise, uh, that other people do not have. Yeah. Either because they have access to specific groups or because they have studied specific things. Or so who are usually called experts in a certain field? Expert studies are kind of a, a usually a close cousin kind of the like oral history. You conduct an expert study because you think these people have something specific to contribute mm -hmm. on that uh, topic that others do not, and not so much because you want people who are otherwise not heard to be heard. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's the, the two strands, basically. So what you see is that this kind of this first project then continue into a broader interest in um, in memory as a historical source uh, after the Second World War. Again, you see actually at that time a geographical uh, difference between the US where the focus becomes very much in this first period on the memories of elites mm -hmm. versus the UK where the focus is much more uh, on documenting the memories and experiences of the working class. And this initial focus reflects the interest simply of the specific actors that are, that are conducting these oral histories on the one hand. So in the US, for instance, uh, the pioneer really was uh, Alan Matthews, who himself uh, conducted already before the war period these elite studies, and this was what he wanted to continue. Uh, and at the same time, it also reflected simply what people could get funding for, so um, funding opportunities at specific localities. Then from there, as I said, you see that the real boom of, uh, of uh, oral history actually comes in the 1960s with the availability of cassette recorders. Um, so you get a dramatic, expan dramatic expansion of oral history because it's just become much more easy to conduct oral history for much broader groups. Um, and you see that oral history is then developing quite rapidly in many different disciplines. So you yeah, have social history, feminist history, black history, and <laughs> labor history. And then from the 1970s, you see that memory of the Shoah is added to that, as well as the uh, history of the LGBT movement, which formed really uh, after uh, 69, basically, after the Stonewall riots. So. Of course, the 60s are known as kind of a period of social emancipation, and it's no coincidence that oral history also in this sense kind of came up 
in this period. Uh, and you see that there were many uh, kind of democratic impulses uh, in this agenda of social and oral history movement. So this boom in, in oral history comes at the same time that you have the civil rights movement, which heyday was really from 54 to 68, the feminist movement with the second feminist wave uh, from about 63 to 80, loosely defined, and then the, the protests against the Vietnam War from 64 to 73. So all these kind of things tie into this idea that uh, not only society has to be democratized, but also this kind of history has to be democratized. So there's a focus on the emancipatory role of oral history strongly in that time. The idea that you should give a voice to the uh, voiceless, a focus on marginalized groups and uh, emancipation struggles in oral history. Uh, and uh, basically the term that's much uh, associated with that is uh, history from below. So this bottom of the that you were talking about. Which is a term that was coined by uh, Edward Palmer Thompson, who uh, was uh, um, a Marxist historian from the UK, as well as a social activist. So because there is this idea that uh, oral history is an emancipatory thing that you do to give back a voice to people, you see at this time also very strongly this connection with, uh, with amateurs, local groups, um, uh, local historians developing in conducting this oral history. So you have these big projects in which it is explicitly the goal to, uh, to have these people um, cooperate in the development of these oral histories uh, with, of course, a, a clear political agenda. In the 1970s, you get uh, first in the early 1970s and then in the 19th, the late 1970s, two different debates about the subjective nature of oral history. So you see by that time oral history has become quite a well-known, uh, um, broadly used discipline and uh, you have this development of, of uh, important debates about the development of this disciplinary field. These debates were there before but they become much larger now because, uh, because these are kind of the, 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 the growing waves of this discipline. So in the early 1970s you first see uh, criticism about the subjective nature of oral history. So the idea that uh, memories are not facts. Um, you cannot be used from the memories of people how history really was. In a way it's going back to the criticism that Ranke voiced already uh, a century earlier. So there's debates on the accuracy of memory as, uh, as a historical source and there are different responses to this from people who work with oral <coughs> histories. So a first response is uh, the kind of um, attempt to professionalize oral history as a discipline by developing guidelines to assess the reliability of the memories that are collected. Uh, and the second response is a counter-criticism to the criticism of subjectivity by pointing out that written sources are in fact uh, subjective as well. Um, apart from that you see that this is a period in which you get a growing interdisciplinarity in the field so historians start to get much more aware of other disciplines also working with oral history methods especially to solve this issue of um, a subjectivity uh, in certain ways, for instance, uh, by using methods of, um, of social psychology and anthropology on how to determine uh, bias and tabulations, um, by using methods of sociology on representative sampling, and uh, mm -hmm. by using methods of documentary history on the rules for checking reliability and the internal consistency of sources. So you see that other disciplines, uh, social science disciplines, had already been uh, countering, or were at that time also countering this same problem, and you get kind of um, an uh, exchange of ideas on how to deal with this. And in 1971, then, the Oral History Society is uh, founded, which also um, is quite active in establishing these kind of guidelines. Okay, so one of the persons 
who, uh, who became quite important in these debates, or, or whose work became a focal point in these debates, was Stutz Sturfer, who uh, had uh, once, a long time ago by that time, uh, uh, participated in the Federal Writers Project, but who was mainly known from a very, very long-running radio show in which he interviewed people, and who wrote a, a, a lot of books in which he used interviews and uh, which uh, were kind of oral histories <coughs> and which were probably for many for a general public the main oral histories that they read the kind of their intake of oral history and at the same time um, uh, well he was not an oral historian in that sense he was a radio interviewing and so there was a lot of criticism within the oral history uh, professional community about his use of standards and these kind of debates actually also contributed to uh, thinking about what these standards then should really be. In the late 1970s we see kind of a new turn, so I need to bring something. So in the early 1970s, we see that there's criticism against the subjectivity, which oral historians try to counter by making oral history less subjective. And what we see in the late 1970s is instead that oral historians start to say no. What makes oral history so interesting is, in fact, its subjectivity. So uh, this is, of course, a very different response to the same challenge in a certain way. And, uh, the most important key text that started off this is a text by Portelli, What Makes Oral History Different, in which he identifies what makes oral history different, orality, narrative form, subjectivity, the different credibility of memory and the relationship between the interviewer and the interviewing, and in which he basically says, uh, these are the strengths of oral history. This is what makes oral history different from other histories. Um, and this is basically what we have to focus on in oral history. So we shouldn't look at trying to establish facts through oral history, but we should focus on this process of, of history making and memorialization. And then this, uh, you see uh, this is again kind of uh, um, coincides with a, a memory boom. So you have this shift from proving the reliability of the sources to celebrating the unreliability, as you can say, of memory as a strength. Uh, because what you can learn from that is about the process of memorialization itself. What do people remember and why do people remember that and how do people remember that and, um, uh, and how does this change over time, these kind of questions become important. So, um, yeah. The subjectivity provides clues about the multiple meanings and experiences of history. History is not the same for everyone. Um, the relations between the past and the present, between memory and personal identity, as well as between individual and collective memory. So you have a recognition of this centrality of subjectivity and the birth, you can say, of the discipline of memory studies at that time. And again, what you see is that, um, uh, that this kind of shift in oral history also corresponds to an attempt to link up to other disciplines in which similar shifts are developing, for instance, in uh, anthropology and anthropology. Interesting in, in this uh, late 1970s and uh, early 1980s is, although you have on the one hand this um, understanding of memory as uh, inherently subjective, you can see. You can say at the same time you have kind of uh, a, a, an increased importance of, of witnesses, of eyewitness accounts, and also an increased authority of eyewitness accounts. Uh, and this has to do a lot with the development of um, histories on uh, the Shoah, where these eyewitness accounts uh, really made a difference in history writing. So you have, for instance, in Germany, the historians write about uh, uh, this, uh, how the Nazi bust is being dealt with. And very important in 87, uh, 
There's a book published by uh, Ralph Giordano, it's called Die Zweite Schuld, which means um, the second guilt in which he basically uh, writes about uh, the, the guilt uh, of the Germans of not talking about what happened in the war, of silencing this past. And so you see at that time that actually you have kind of a moral authority of eyewitness accounts of certain times established, but of course linked to specific groups. And uh, you see also, this is a common thing of course, that uh, the, the memories of specific groups are uh, much more recorded also than the memories of other groups. Um, and uh, at the same time in the 1980s you see the establishment of truth and reconciliation commissions. Again with this idea that you should not silence the past, you should talk about it in order to overcome this. This happens first. Yeah? yeah. Can I ask one question about this neurology? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, would this, uh, is it normal that we ask people to talk about the thing that they don't want to talk? For instance, you go to a person who, whose father or like mother we are exiled, and you ask him uh, to talk about his memories, his past, mm -hmm. what it, it was like and how he got through all these things and to remember all the things that like to, to start talking about this. Is it moral that we are like, uh, of course, it's kind of benefit that it's for young generation that it won't uh, ever happen, of course. But when we start with morality, <laughs> where is the morality with those people? Or how we can uh, start recording this uh, type of history, not to... Like, Okay, I understand your yeah. question. I'm, of course, the, the, mor the moral authority of the eyewitness who has lived to s through certain things is something different than the morality to ask certain questions. Yeah. However, you see that, for instance, with the Shoah, um, uh, this, um, exp this, of course, was very painful for yeah. people, for a lot of people to talk mm -hmm. about this. Uh, partly it is so that some people will not want to talk about it and you can of course do nothing about it. We're not, we're not yeah. holding people yeah, at gunpoint, yeah. right? Now you have to tell them. <laughs> people choose whether they want to tell their history or not. It's their decision. Uh, however, it can be extremely painful and traumatic for people to do so, yes. Yeah, it's kind um, of privacy that you are saying, for instance, even in, uh, like the Sovlab or others are writing some books about the repressions of women or some kind of this, and they are writing, they write down the names of those people. Of yeah. course, it's kind of the history that you should remember that those people really existed, but on the other side, it's very painful to remember that, for instance, your grandmother was somebody who gave through these things. It's not really heroically, like, of but course, yeah, but still it's kind of... Generally, people who do share their stories do so because they want this to be remembered, mm -hmm. yes. right? And it's otherwise they will not share. Still, it might be painful for you also to listen to certain yes. things, so yeah. you need to prepare yourself for that. But mm -hmm. this really depends on the kind of and they also story you're working on. Permission to write the evidence, yeah, of course. I, I, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, of course like it's like normally with the whole kind it's of always thing, not but, yeah. And as I know, there is a... Also, uh, uh, with oral history, uh, there is a discussion about some therapeutic effect yeah. from the yeah. mm -hmm. interview. Yeah. We were, he's talking, he or she is talking about her traumatic experience. It, it has some uh, therapeutic effect yeah. on her. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but for some yes, for some for me, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Very it's good. just yes. like yes. in the in the yeah. history, but uh, we are not psychologists. For instance, I'm not psychologist to so sit there. Okay, you're talking about your painful experience. No, uh, we want like we want the historical uh, view of them, how it was really because it was a part of this. Yes, thing. but so here is your role as well. Yeah, but there but is a question. Uh, I mean, there is a question how we should write down these histories. 
Okay, we will talk, so we will talk later yeah. in the week also more about empathy and how you conduct interviews, right? Yeah. But of yeah. course, I mean, some memories are more painful than yeah. others and you have to be aware of that. However, if people uh, decide to share something with them, well, it's their decision. And, um, and usually people decide to share things because they want them to be known, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, another problem is that people often decide not to share certain things which might be interesting to know. This is something which is specifically the case, as for instance with this, uh, with this case of the Shoah, uh, with the perpetrators, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, this is a very different question, how do you deal with people who uh, give a very polished account of what actually happened, for instance. But we will look at this uh, also Maybe later. I could just add one. I think one of the strengths of oral history reading Richie and others talking about it is that very often when you begin the interview you might meet resistance. Mm -hmm. But during the process of the interview people actually find that they want to say things that mm -hmm. yeah. initially they thought they didn't want to talk about. In a good right. interview of course people right. tend to so you, it's about building trust and report right. as well. So oh. of course oh. people first need to find a have this trust before they will share things, but um, we will come to that as well. But in general, by that time, people have already agreed to be interviewed, and uh, you genuinely start an interview uh, uh, with people that agree to be interviewed on specific things. You tell them what you're going to be, in, what, what you're interested about, so it cannot really come as a surprise to them mm -hmm. that you are. Interested. And you have consent, like you have yes. consent that mm -hmm. you can share it. Uh, yeah, if you, if so you, don't, you, you don't. have consent before, but again, you also make sure you have consent mm -hmm. afterwards, and yeah. uh, then you have them read from mm -hmm. you. So there's a very elaborate mm -hmm. process yeah. to this. Yeah. So you see that that from the from the early 1980s, you have these truth and Re reconciliation commissions, uh, in which, of course, the goal is not to talk to oral historians, but uh, to talk to have conversations between people who lived through a certain. Period. You see this first. Um, the first case is actually Bolivia, where they started this in '82, and Argentina one year later. Then, of course, most famously in South Africa, when apartheid uh, fell. And uh, but you also see that the same kind of um, uh, mechanism was adopted in uh, in other countries. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in Canada, you had uh, this truth and reconciliation project focusing on uh, the relations of the indigenous population uh, with uh, settlers. Uh, you have kind of the same, uh, same process going on in uh, Australia with the Aboriginal population and settlers. And in Germany you have um, a very long enquête commission on what happened uh, during the GDR, um, which also tried to tackle this kind of testimony. In the 1980s, you have the main debate in oral history again about the gift, about kind of uh, oral history as either a really an academic enterprise or a popular enterprise. This, of course, because the discipline itself had been developing so much, had become so much of an established discipline with its own standards and routines and formats and methods by that time. Uh, that people started to think if it's not a time for contemplation, what are we doing here? The base was this kind of history from below. Uh, are we not getting too far removed actually with all our professional standards and guidelines from this idea of history from below and from this participation of broader strata um, of the civilization? And you see that this is a debate that is specifically sprung in, uh, in the UK and Birmingham with the popular memory group, which uh, which is very critical of professional historians because it sees them as undermining this radical potential of oral history as a history from below. So what develops from that is not a debate on the objectivity of the narrator, but instead a debate on the objectivity of the interviewer. So <coughs> you have this critique, and it comes mainly from feminist history and anthropology, but also a step from this a popular memory group and other sources um, uh, about the role of the interviewer in shaping oral history. So this idea that the interviewer is just um, uh, 
uh, professional and somehow objective is, is uh, kind of um, outdated and people start to realize that the interviewer has a great role in shaping the history uh, by the questions that she asks or he asks, by the kind of responses uh, that you give to, uh, to the respondent. Um, and um, so there was kind of this uh, uh, the realization of the need to be reflexive about your own role, uh, why are you conducting interviews, uh, uh, what do you hope to get from that yourself, uh, not only does it, does it help a certain group, but why do you do it as an interviewer, um, and what are your own kind of, what is your background, what are the biases that you are taking with you um, when recording such interviews. And a very uh, famous slogan actually from the time is this uh, shared authority coming from Michael Fick. Basically the idea of shared authority is before the idea was about sharing authority, but sharing authority kind of assumes that somebody has the authority and chooses to share it, whereas the idea of shared authority is that authority always lies with both parties to this interview from the start. And again, with actually what you see with every debate is this is then something that's being discussed simultaneously in several social sciences and, and, um, and discussed not only within the disciplines but also among different disciplines. <coughs> in the 1990s, of course, uh, you have the digital revolution, so um, computers become available. Uh, more widely for everyone, you get different methods of recording and this raises specifically questions about the accessibility of interviews and how to deal with that. That is to say, before it was so that if you recorded with a voice recorder, for instance, an interview, um, you put it somewhere in an archive and usually uh, you transcribe it, you put that somewhere in an archive and it might be that some other professional historians turn up and want to look at it as well. That's good. But now, of course, a lot is published on the internet. And this means that uh, resilience of people all around the world, if they are interested in that, with one click of their mouse, mm -hmm. can enter the interview, uh, which is a very different kind of publicity um, uh, that uh, not only you as an interviewer need to be aware of, but that you also need to make your narrators aware of. because. Um, not everybody is aware of that. It depends a bit on the age group you're working with as well. But uh, this kind of digital accessibility of, um, of interviews asks for very specific informed consent um, if you are indeed going to publish uh, your interviews uh, electronically. And then last, but I will be very brief on this because I saw that we will be talking about post-communist oral history specifically later again. Uh, you see some developments that come from this, uh, basically this, this turning point with the fall of communism. So you have the development of oral histories in the post-socialist countries. Uh, both uh, post authoritarian oral history accounts, on, so histories of previously silent subjects, for instance, histories of, uh, of uh, victims of Stalinist repression, for instance, were started in the 1990s quite a lot, um, or marginal groups in socialist society, as well as just uh, topics that were not considered interesting enough to record in socialist times. There's kind of a boom in recording those. Um, and, and you get, of course, also an interest in just uh, uh, recording the tremendous changes of the time and what that does to people. So you see also oral histories that focus specifically on this turning point in time in 89-91. Uh, and what you see also developing with that, and that's the last thing I will say, this is a quote from a very recent book that I can highly uh, recommend by uh, Miroslav Anjek and Pavel Luka on, uh, on the situation in, uh, in the Czech Republic is what you also see is a very strong awareness of the political use of history. Not only in the past and not only under authoritarian regimes, but in general and, and also now. Okay, are there 
Any questions? Mm -hmm. um, I was asked a question uh, on the reliability of the interviews. For example, people sometimes ask me, how do you know that uh, these people speak the truth? Or how do you know that they don't over fantasize or they don't over uh, improvise? So I have my kind of answer to this question, but it seems to me a bit weak. So I, I was wondering what would you answer? So what do you answer? Well, I, my answer was that um, most of them my interviews last for five hours and when you speak for five hours, it's not that easy to make something up. Uh, there must be something in, in your experience or in your acquaintances' experience or so at least something you've heard of uh, to speak about it. So. It's not that easy to, like, well, of course, there is a possibility of fantasizing or improvising, and uh, it's okay, but uh, I don't think that people tell direct lies during the interviews, and I think that they enjoy, in fact, they enjoy the process of uh, being honest to somebody, mm -hmm. especially when they're anonymous. I think that there's uh, the chance of telling lies to um, it's, not, it's not very big, But what about double checking, like double checking the information? You, you ha have no answer, so this narrative. Yes, you can double check it and. Double check use. how? Because, uh, I don't know the oh. techniques, and I, would, um, I was in going my, to ask yeah. you yeah, about the case, techniques uh, of double everybody checking. Everybody has their um, like subject, like uh, in my case, people. Mm -hmm. Just uh, remember their own personal history, like where they were born, their childhood in PDC, mm -hmm. and uh, so far. So uh, yeah. So in, the, in this case, you I can't see how can you double check some stuff. So Not about the personal stuff, but in general, like when ah, you are making like uh, re reconstruction yes, of the for. history, you should double check, yeah, and yeah. then like it's kind of puzzle how yeah. you make the like mm -hmm. recovery yeah, of this, the history, this part is and that's make that makes it easy not to like yeah. Yeah. Exactly. not to base on the fantasies. <laughs> okay, so you want to add something? Uh, I have a question, just a question. So what kind of truths we are talking about? Mm -hmm. Or what kind of lies? That's a good question I think. <laughs> uh, but all kind of truths they I think they they I mean I think the they, they who meant, I think they meant uh, like all kinds of lies like personal lies for example saying something, like exaggerating, uh, faking, exaggerating. taking some memories, for example, like um, exaggerating, yeah, mm -hmm. or... Uh, taking, or if one fakes the memory, I think you can check it with facts, probably, but... It's no, what if you said... And it's 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 uh, the only source you have is this person. Yeah. Oh, if I this is a case when you have this person as yeah, a only person. source, okay, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, it's the so okay, yeah. there's no other way. Yeah. So yeah. 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 If they improvise, if they feel like that, if mm -hmm. they do it fake, if it's that's actually there's yeah. it's very yeah. likely that all of us have memories that are untrue, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. You are aware of them. We're not necessarily lying when we're telling something. Mm -hmm. it yes, but for example, I have an argument uh, because uh, if you know that the uh, 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 the mainstream idea about Phoenician is, is like this, but you are trying to uh, see more uh, uh, intellectual no, or, or like a I mean, more... The social desirability factor yeah, yes. is everywhere. Yeah. 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 You can but copy somebody else's idea. That's, that's, that's a part of self-presentation in everyday life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we are... Uh, uh, you know, these forces are the way to construct the social reality. They construct this particular social reality, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's their sense, that's their feeling. And yes. I think that's perfectly fine. If they mm -hmm. improvise, <laughs> yes. 
Yes, I agree. That's the main angle for life. Like, that's like, that's what I found. Why don't you find out? Actually, okay. So what did you want to say? No, no, no. Right. She is saying how they feel about how they feel is how they been. I think. How they construct today? You know. Which we are talking not about this course as a narrative, but about our own history. That is about you know like getting back to the past. So then it's a problem, you know, because yeah. today you are telling about what was there. Yeah. So then the just pure this source is not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually because it's mm -hmm. not the past what we are telling now. Mm -hmm. So it's interpretation I'm, I'm also interested in your answer. Mm -hmm. I mean this is of course part of the idea of the interdisciplinary and making use of psychology and, and uh and anthropology and other methods. I mean partly this is something which just happens. Uh, and I think the main answer to that is that we are looking to subjective at subjective stories. We're looking at memories, we're not looking at facts. We're looking at the kind of people in the world. The, the accounts that people have of specific periods, how they have experienced this period. And in the experiences that some people have, you see that things that might actually be very small events are very big. Yeah. And the other way around. So very big events might hardly turn up in these narratives. Mm. You see that if you interview people 30 years after the fact, mm. it's very likely they have a very different kind of estimation of what happened than they have when you would ask them on the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, the only thing you can do is be aware of that and show this in how you mm -hmm. analyze what's being said. Mm -hmm. um, but you cannot make people remember facts. Mm -hmm. This is not going to happen. So the only expectation I have using the oral history on, or any method, I mean, interviewing, it's the, I'm looking at the, what people see, what people remember, because it means this is important for her or mm -hmm. for him. This is why he um, remembers the fact A or B and not the C, D, E, D, or not the B. And, and why they do this, why they are remembering these certain facts and not the others, and, well, mm -hmm. and um, what's, maybe what is the underpinning, how they interpret the world, actually, yeah. to, to say it very briefly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this, so this is, is what I expect, mm -hmm. usually. I think that there's one side note to be made, that is, uh, oral histories are being used also with eyewitness accounts in some effect, yeah. so then they are being used to establish certain mm -hmm. facts. Mm -hmm. In that case, the only way you can go around this is by having enough, from enough different sources. Mm -hmm. If a lot of people tend to tell you the same thing, mm -hmm. not knowing each other, coming from different mm -hmm. things with the same fact, there's a high probability it's right, right? right? So, it's, but it depends on what, you know the kind of research and history. Or and uh, there's some impact of why people remember the fact like this because it can be traumatic. It can be like so we, we don't know how, why they remember. Like we should go deeper in the psychology and this kind of stuff. So like, but there are many pitfalls. There are also yeah. examples known of people like large groups of people remembering the same, but it happens yeah. to come from a misinformed TV yes. show. For yeah, instance. this it happens. Does, it does, it does, this topic. So uh, the only thing I think we can do is really be aware of that. Yeah, and be very mm -hmm. sensitive. But apart from that, I think that, that mm -hmm. it was kind of concluded. Mm -hmm. Sorry Thank to you say much. about that. Okay. How, how it is? No, this depends very much on your research. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, uh, and it for instance, it depends on what do you want to do. Do you want to make like a broad history of mm -hmm. how, you know, multiple layers in society view to certain events? Or are you fo focusing on, mm -hmm. you know, an, a, a oh, biography yeah. or, you know, a collective mm -hmm. biography of a very specific group of people? This is a very different question. Are, are you looking with people or, you know? Are you looking at the time for which you have the luxury of choosing between a lot of people, or do you have to deal with simply uh, those uh, witnesses that are still there? Mm -hmm. So th there are many different questions. Yeah. 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 One, one yeah. example, uh, in Germany at the University of Jena in the mid-90s, a history student for his master thesis interviewed his grandfather about his memories of World War II. Yes. And then he looked up the facts 
So really, how memory affects so juxtapose? It was a, a very good uh, master thesis. It wasn't published because really, on a concrete example, it showed and demonstrated how uh, uh, memories change over time and how it really it is not fact based or something. Mm -hmm. yeah? So the authenticity of the eyewitness is something also that is subjective and needs to be questioned then in the analysis in the process of analysis. And actually, what are the facts? Who yeah. knows whether the facts are really... <laughs> he, he looked at the, the, the sources, the uh, uh, reports of the uh, Reichswehr, the army reports and so on. So, so what happened in this place where he what? was? And so he reconstructed this. So he had the knowledge of that his grandfather was there and there and there during World War II. And then he looked up the sources that are available from the archives and so on confronted the memories with yes. what can be con uh, reconstructed from uh, other sources. Yeah? So, but uh, the past is and will be a foreign country for us because we cannot do a time hoop and move back and look how it was. Even then probably it will be something very selective and subjective. Okay, thank you very much, Amika. That was a wonderful, comprehensive introduction and start to uh, our, our workshop. So we